Prior to the creation of the honor concept in 1951, honor at the Naval Academy was neither codified nor discussed at great length. As a result, midshipmen themselves were given the responsibility to deal with honor and conduct cases, with little to no oversight by senior officers. Honor systems at this time were characterized by the concept of midshipman ownership, meaning that midshipman leadership dealt with infractions of honor or poor conduct and decided on the consequences themselves. Sometimes, midshipmen would even have the class assembled together in secret sessions to discuss how to deal with the most flagrant cases of misconduct. Consequently, putative measures would vary greatly. The fact that honor and conduct were completely in the hands of midshipmen presented some problems. In the early 1900s, prearranged fistfights between midshipmen to settle arguments were common. The most famous of these was the highly publicized Meriwether versus Branch incident, which resulted in the death of midshipman Branch in 1905. Another pitfall of the secret of honor and conduct systems of the early 1900s was that without guidance, it was possible for midshipmen to develop standards of honor that were inconsistent with those intended by academy officials. One of the most popular forms of cheating that had become widely accepted at the academy in the early 1900s was the doping system. This system was characterized by students passing exam answers from morning exams to students taking the same exam in the afternoon. In the early 1950s, recognizing the detrimental effects of the doping system, a group of midshipmen led by Ross Perot and the then brigade commander William P. Lawrence set out to abolish the doping system and create a permanent honor system. The then superintendent, Admiral Hill, believing in the concept of midshipman ownership, challenged the group of midshipmen to design the honor system and then subject the finished product to a brigade-wide vote. That way, each midshipman would feel personally responsible for its maintenance. Thus, the group of midshipmen formed an executive committee composed of selected first-classmen and popularly elected class and company representatives to create honor standards. All these offenses were reported to the executive committee, and if these offenses were found to be well-grounded, they would be reported to the Commandant with recommendations. The Executive Committee also formed Brigade and Class Honor Boards, where each case would be viewed separately by peers with no standardized punishments. This honor system developed by the Executive Committee was subsequently dubbed the Honor Concept. While similar to West Point's Honor Code, it deferred to it in many important ways. In general, Admiral Hill and the Committee wanted to avoid the establishment of a system that operated on fear, one that coerced obedience instead of fostering strong moral character, including developing mutual bonds of loyalty, trust, and friendship. Indeed, West Point's honor code of a cadet would not lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate anyone who did characterized what they exactly wanted to avoid, as the last phrase made it mandatory to turn in fellow classmates. They also feared that this non-toleration clause would group together larger infractions with smaller ones, Instead, the committee viewed peer-to-peer -peer counseling as a better option than separation, which also sent a strong message that academy officials trusted midshipmen's judgment. Every generation of men's has their problems. Unfortunately, the ideas of non-codification, avoiding fear-based obedience, and midshipmen ownership in the honor system did not last after Admiral Hill and the class of 1952 had departed. Subsequently, the system began moving away from its original intent and towards what its creators had tried to avoid. Mids who were caught committing honor offenses throughout the 60s and 70s would often try to justify their actions by pointing out that there was no specific clause outlawing them. In response, starting in the late 1960s, honor violations were added to midshipman regulations until it encompassed more than 30 pages of regs. Perot himself mentioned that once midshipmen began to perceive a regulation as draconian, they would deliberately choose a dishonorable path for themselves in an attempt to prevent the separation of their classmates, all the while wholeheartedly believing this to be the right course of action. At this time, midshipmen decided on whether the defendant was guilty and the recommended sanctions to be awarded. There were no battalion-level adjudications. Guilty midshipmen were either sanctioned at the company level or forwarded to the commandant. This created a gray area of offenses that violated the honor concept, but in midshipmen eyes, did not warrant separation. This oversight, combined with a lack of personalized guidance from committed individuals such as Admiral Hill, fostered a culture of complacency and tolerance with regards to honor violations, in direct conflict with the off-stated message that the brigade owns the honor concept. The cracks in the system were eventually exposed to the public by one of the bigger scandals in the history of the academy.
1992 electrical engineering cheating scandal. The 1992 WE cheating scandal implicated over 130 members of the class in 1994, resulting in 34 being separated, 38 being cleared, and the rest being put on some form of academic or honor probation for the rest of their time at the academy. What initially began with one student acquiring and then attempting to sell copies of the upcoming WE final snowballed in dozens of students trying to cover up the evidence that they were involved. As a result of that double E cheating scandal of 1992, certain programs were put into place. First, Admiral Larson was brought back for a second tour as superintendent. He was made a four-star, the only four-star superintendent there has been at the Naval Academy. And he brought some top flight talent, Captain Bogle, Captain Walsh, who was later commander of the Pacific Fleet, to implement character development programs, brown bag, capstone, the ethics course was put into place, and other measures. So they codified character development and honor in a way that heretofore had not been. They created the company officer master's program, which incentivized better quality officers to come for their shore duty here and be mentors and leaders of midshipmen. Arguably, company officers the most important job here on the yard. But they made very decisive moves that are still in place to this day. The Armitage Report, a 1993 congressional report to the Secretary of the Navy on honor at the United States Naval Academy, also recommended several massive changes, such as the expansion of the Brigade Honor Board from seven to nine members, requiring supermajority to convict, and the implementation of honor offense sanctions such as probation outside of the normal conduct system. The 1992 cheating scandal revealed a lot of shortcomings about the honor concept. In 2009, a group of midshipmen led by midshipman First Class Stephen Shaw provided a new vision for the future of the honor remediation system. Quote, the establishment of the remediation program after the electrical engineering cheating incident with no modification of the message that midshipmen who commit honor offenses will be separated only aggravated the situation. It cannot be claimed that the use of separation by a system aimed at growth and development is beneficial for the individual who comes into contact with the system. The dilemma midshipmen faced in 1992 was that if they exercised the moral courage to tell the truth as a good naval officer should, they would lose any possibility of ever becoming a naval officer. If the honor concept is truly aimed at development, as it is claimed to be, then remediation can be the only justifiable response to an honor offense." End quote. This framework became the basis for honor at the academy until today. For me, the honor concept is the brigade trusting and owning um, the responsibility to make good officers, make people of um, who, who make the right choices. Um, we spent four years here developing ourselves to learn how to make decisions that are right, to learn how to do the right thing um, when nobody's watching, when everybody is watching, when there's very low stakes and there's very high stakes. Everybody sees the honor system as the bad guys, but nobody comes into the brigade thinking honor is bad. People go down the slippery slope because in terms of uh, physics and academics, um, because they don't see the value in their work. Um, you and your work and the things you turn in are representations of yourself or maybe, you know, whatever class you're taking isn't something that you love, um, but be proud of the knowledge that you have. Be proud of the person you've become and the things you've learned. And if it is not something that you're proud of, you know, what can you do to make it something that you're proud of? Since its creation in the early 1950s, the honor concept has provided midshipmen with a framework to live in accordance with the highest ideals of duty, honor, and loyalty. For it to be effective, and if midshipmen truly want to own the honor concept, it is up to the midshipmen themselves to make the conscious decision to buy in and strive to live for those ideals.